Okay, great. So we're going to get started and maybe some more people will filter in, but uh, looks like we got a nice big crowd here today for the environment modules talk. We'll be talking about a little piece of software that I use very regularly. It's called environment modules. It's a really old piece of software. They've rewritten it in Python, but it's originally TCL and we'll get into it with some hands-on practice here. Uh, first though, I want to tell you a little story about an email that I get every couple of months and to set up for this story, I need to tell you a little bit about my work. I work at a small research firm where we've got a whole bunch of scientists running around in lab coats with beakers and they generate huge amounts of data, terabytes and terabytes of data on a regular basis. They need to take all of this raw data and run it through some crazy software in order to get to the results that they need so they can publish it in their papers. Now, we've got about 15 labs across our institute. Each of those has got some or a lot of researchers, depending on the size of the lab, and they've running, they're running their research data through this crazy esoteric software that hasn't been updated in five years and the developer doesn't exist anymore, or nobody's ever heard of, and that's just standard practice. They need to do it to replicate someone else's research or to build off of someone else's research. This isn't software that's been packaged for any distribution known to man, and in many cases there's not even build instructions for it. They're running this on a whole bunch of servers. I manage a couple of clusters, so they're doing this in Slurm. Their jobs are being scheduled, and uh, the software needs to be available on every system in the cluster or on every system if they're not clustered, just that they might log into to do any of this processing. <clears throat> and most of these servers I've built are running Ubuntu 20.04, uh, just because that's what I standardized, standardized on when I took over. Now, the email that I get in question is a little bit hard to see with uh, the projectors we've got, but it says here, hey, can you install the latest version of R on the server? Now, R is a statistical programming language, and I get this email every time a new version of R comes out. One came out three days ago, sorry, four days ago now. Um, and this is a really, really beautiful email because I don't know off the top of my head which lab this researcher works for. Hello, welcome in. I don't know off the top of my head which server or servers this researcher might be using. And I can go and I can log into every system and run who, I can run last log and see who's been in this machine, but that's not really going to be too much help if I need to go back and forth with the user to make sure that I'm getting the requirements. Now normally, without using environment modules, I'd have to set it up on their particular server or in their particular home directory and then reconfigure either their whole server or just that user's account to point to the newer version of R. But with the power of environment modules, I can respond to this one sentence email with one of my own. The latest version of R is now in modules. And that's all. That's all that I have to do for that interaction for that, with that user. And when someone else comes along and thinks, oh man, I could really use that new version of R I heard about, came out a couple of days ago, it's already in there. I don't have to duplicate my work for another user. I don't have to duplicate my work for another lab. I don't have to duplicate my work for another server. It's all just right where it wants to be, ready for the users to use. Now maybe you're not a sysadmin for an HPC uh, cluster. That's fine. Maybe you're a software developer, or maybe you're someone who uses development versions of software. That's pretty common. I mean, this is Linux Fest Northwest. Case in point, I had to use uh, that's hard to see. I had to use a couple different versions of raw therapy. It's an image processing application. It's got 50 branches on the GitHub, and I needed to use two of those different branches for a project. Now, the code bases had diverged enough that I couldn't merge them easily, and I also couldn't just call the compiled binaries directly because it's a dynamically linked program against its own libraries that get compiled when you compile the binary as well. So, setting it up was would have been quite difficult if I was doing it all by hand, but I did it in modules and I still have a head full of hair as a result. Maybe you're not one of those people who uses a lot of different versions of the same software. Maybe you're just a normal everyday power user and your bash RC looks like this. Does anyone's bash RC look like this? You got a bunch of exports of your path and just arbitrary directory locations? No, mine has in the past and I've done it to other people too. This is a bad, bad time. It sucks for maintenance because you have to do it for every user. You gotta maintain that. If they manage their own bash RC and you're trying to manage it on top of that, 
it's a nightmare. If you want to move this to a new machine, no, nah, it's, it's, it's a big mess and you don't want to do it. You don't have to. You don't have to do this anymore. I don't do this anymore. Modules is good. Modules is the answer. It's a software management application, but really it might be more accurate to say that it's just there to modify your environment. Now, you might feel like you already have the perfect tools for software management to make sure that applications you need are available where you need them. Maybe you use your regular built-in package manager with your DEBs or your RPM files or whatever it is that Arch uses. You know, but this has got some limitations that don't really make it fit too perfectly for what we need. First, you install a package on one machine and it's just on one machine. You know, if I install some DEB on this computer, it's not helpful on this computer. It's not helpful on your computer. Only one version can be installed at a time. If I install FUBAR 1.0, and next week I upgrade to FUBAR 1.1, which has deprecated some of the original features hello, of 1.0. I can't use those features anymore. I can't use 1.0 anymore. I'm stuck with 1.1 now. I can only have one version installed at a time. Additionally, every package that you install needs to be packaged by someone. And a lot of software, most software that's written, isn't packaged. Additionally, you can't have conflicts. If Scientist A needs FUBAR and Scientist B needs FUBAS. You can't have those both installed at the same time. Someone is going to be upset and someone is going to suffer and that someone is going to be me. Now you, maybe you've got the solutions to some of these problems. You can install things on one machine or 10,000 machines all at once. And it's all the same to you because you use config management. That's good. You should do that. So you don't care that you can only install a package on one machine. And, you know, you can use update alternatives to change the version of Java or what have you, PHP, that you're using on a machine. But update alternatives is a system-wide change. It doesn't help you much for per user. And you can, if you futz around with the environment variables enough, you can get it on per user level. But, again, you're managing people's bash RC files. That puts us exactly in the problem that we just had. And maybe you don't care that things need packaging because packaging isn't that hard. I mean, there's a thousand tutorials for it. You can do packaging, I can do packaging. Anyone can do packaging, just pick up the keyboard. Easy peasy. I don't have a slide for a line going through new, no conflicts because I still haven't found a solution to conflicting packages. And maybe you have, has anyone in here found one? Awesome. So you don't want to use old style packages, but you've got one of those newer solutions. That, that's much shinier than old school packages. Maybe you use Docker. Docker's a great tool, I love Docker. I don't think that Docker is the best tool for the use case we're describing here, where you need to use some specific application that nobody has built a package for because there's not even build instructions. Docker is mostly useful for entire stacks or whole complex environments. Sometimes that's gonna be perfect, sometimes that's gonna be exactly what you need, but a lot of the times it's not. A lot of the times you're still gonna have to do the work of setting that up of building your own Docker image files <clears throat> and distributing them. Secondly, it's not built for HPC, so at least for me, that's just one more layer of abstraction, one more place where something can and will go wrong in trying to get these different processes to communicate with each other across a cluster. Next up, the user needs to learn it. Now, for you and I, this may seem simple. I mean, it's Docker, you know, there's like a dozen subcommands, and each of those has got two dozen flags for it. We can get that memorized in a couple of months of practice, but these people don't want to. These researchers who are running around with their beakers don't want to have to do that. And it's very rude to make them do that. They're not dumb. It's not like they couldn't figure it out if they wanted to. Their brains are full of science. They're big, smart PhD people. But they, don't, they shouldn't be forced to learn Docker. You shouldn't foist that upon them. That's taking someone else and saying, hey, you do my job. All right, so... Maybe you've got some other tool, maybe, oh, additionally, yeah, like I said, you have to, uh, you've got to build your Docker image files. So maybe you use Anaconda, right? Anaconda, great, lots of research projects use Anaconda. It's mostly for Python. It is for other languages too, but those languages need to be packaged. If you need to use, if you're trying to use Anaconda for some built from source compiled binary, Anaconda's not going to be helpful to you. Also, the user needs to learn it. That's less of a problem with Anaconda because, in general, scientific users will already know Anaconda, whereas they won't already know Docker. 
but they all note modules because it's basically the standard for HPC. And most importantly, this is a little bit difficult to see here, this is a screenshot of the Anaconda website. See here we have free, starter, pro, business, and enterprise. This insinuation that you may have to pay money in order to use this software is enough to send most cheapskates, like me, running away with their tail between their legs. The real answer to this question of how do we manage the software for people is environment modules. And it's kind of criminal how simple it is. Modules is in some disruptive, scalable, newfangled enterprise software. It's not some multi-million dollar project. At the end of the day, when you look at the files on your system, modules is just a TCL script. It's an old scripting language, and it's just a script. All it does is it modifies your environment. It's not a whole new architecture. It's not a whole new thing that you have to learn. You can integrate this in your system today, now, and I'll show you how. It's easy. Setting up modules is three steps. One, oh, yeah, this looks a lot like modifying your bash RC file but it's done automatically. It's done for you by modules. You don't have to do it by hand. You don't have to do that suffering that we talked about earlier. So setting up modules easy. Step number one, you install a single package. It's named environment-modules on every single distribution that I've checked. Second up, you need somewhere to put the files. You need somewhere to put your software that you're compiling or downloading if it's pre-compiled binaries. I need somewhere to put your module files. So just a couple of file paths. Last thing you need to do is you need to edit one plain text file, the modules path file. And that's it. That's all that you need to do to set up modules. This setup is so simple that it may look very familiar to you as the standard example for basic usage on every single config management suite out there. Whether you're using Puppet or Chef or Ansible or Salt, you know how to do this already with your existing config management. You don't have to go and look up, man, how do I manage Docker containers with my config management? That's a whole essay. No, this is, this is things that you already know how to do. This talk was originally going to have some live demos, but I was worried that they uh, wouldn't work live, so they're now pre-recorded. Actually installing the software, like I said, I'm doing this here on Ubuntu 2310 uh, on my laptop, but it's just a single package, and it doesn't even have any dependencies. So it installs and that's that, great, you've installed modules, cool. Now let's set it up, let's create the directories for it to live in. All right, easy peasy, make directory slash modules, one for the software itself to live in and a second, like I said, for the module files to live in. The software is what you're actually going to be accessing, right, in order to access the software, and the module files are what's going to tell modules what environment variables to modify. Now, a couple of points of note here. These, in this example, are just local directories on my laptop because I'm doing this for an example. Um, normally, if you're doing this on a server infrastructure, these need to be network mounts. So if you have the money to do GPFS, go ahead and blow that and you're great. Um, if you've got fancy NFS with Kerberos so that it's actually secure and authenticated, do that, wonderful. If you're using old honor-based uh, authentication for NFS where you just say, hey man, trust me, the user has these groups. These should be read-only exports. That's a problem that I see a lot looking at other people's modules setups is that their modules files live in a read-write export. You shouldn't do that, it's bad. Second thing of note here is that I'm just making one directory for the software and one for the modules files. If you have a heterogeneous infrastructure, like I said, mine is mostly Ubuntu 20.04, if you've got an infrastructure where some stuff is still running since 7, I think you have until fall, um, some stuff's on 2004, some stuff's on 2204, some stuff is on CentOS Stream, some stuff is on Enterprise Linux 9, I think we're on now, right? You, the, a lot of those aren't going to be binary compatible. And so when you compile software for 2004, you don't want someone on CentOS 7 trying to run that same binary. For that reason, most of the time, I've got these set, branched down further into subdirectories for architecture, subdirectories for the distribution, subdirectories for the distribution version. I'm not doing that here just because this is for example purposes, but if you were to implement this in your infrastructure on an actual server uh, in, in a data center, that's what you would want to do. 
um, because otherwise it's going to get a little bit messy when someone tries to go and run their software that, hey, look, it's already there for me, and they get a core dump. All right, last thing that we do is we modify a single text file, and this is just to tell modules where to look for the module files. We created that directory, and now we're going to tell it where to look. This is the file location, and there's a bunch of comments and the default locations that you'd put modules in, in there already. We're just going to delete all of that because we don't need it. And we're going to put in a single line in this file, slash modules, slash module files. And then that's it. That's all you have to do. You've now set up modules on your infrastructure. If you had to do it on the uh, network mount, you know, make sure that that network mount is available everywhere, but you all config manage, so I'm sure that's simple and easy. That's it. That's all you do to set up modules. You don't have to do any group management. You don't have to do any starting of services with systemd. It's just that. You do have to restart your shell. That is the one and only thing that you have to do after this. And the reason for that is because modules itself, the module command that you use to interact with it, isn't a binary. It's a shell alias that gets populated. So you've got to restart your shell so that it'll re-grab the profiles uh, the, the profile files from the Etsy directory and you'll actually have modules available. <clears throat> so now that we've set up modules, let's put some software in it, shall we? Step number one is to get and compile your software and we'll walk through that today. Next, you need to write a, one single module file to tell modules where to look for that software and how to modify your environment. And then you use the software, and that is so easy, you can learn how to do it in one minute, and I'll show you that today. So, compiling the software is different for every single project out there. Normally, projects today have GitHub. As much as we may hate Microsoft, it's what everybody is using. So, there will be some section named Compilation, Branches, and Git, or it'll be named Building Binaries, or maybe it's named Compiling from Source. Or maybe it's instructions in a separate file named install or building. Wherever it is, you can usually find build instructions. If you can't find build instructions for the project, it really becomes a matter of the more you practice, the better you get. If you build two dozen projects that have got explicit instructions, you can generally look at a project that doesn't and say, oh, this looks familiar, I know how to do this. So don't start on the most esoteric, most unmaintained software that you've ever seen. Start with something sensible. <clears throat> these last two, these uh, separated out files, generally will be extremely verbose and have detailed documentation on every single aspect of building. Uh, they'll have lists of prerequisites that you need. They'll have exactly what every option does. Uh, and the reason for that is that somebody broke it out into a separate file because it, the contents were too long to just put in the main uh, readme. So let's do it for R. We got that email earlier saying, hey, can you install that latest version of R for me? Let's do it. Step number one, can't see it very well, but you go to the R website. R is one of those few remaining projects that actually distributes its own source code on its own website instead of doing it on GitHub. And so you just click one of these links in here that you can't see, and you'll wind up with a list of tarballs. The most recent one here, you might be able to read it, is released on 04 24 2024. So that was four days ago. <clears throat> you right click one of those links and copy it to your clipboard, and then we'll download it and get everything set up to do compilation. So, first, I'm creating a directory here to hold our source files while we're working on them. Heading on into there and going to download the tarball link that we had just copied to the clipboard. That'll take a minute to download because my internet at home is a little bit slow, but it doesn't take too long. It's a big file, so give it a break. We'll untar the tarball and it'll just spit out a whole bunch of files there. We'll go into the directory that's created. And if we take a look at the contents of this directory, let's, let's sit here and, and look at them for a minute. We've got some different uh, directories. That's these bold blue ones that hold most of the source code. There's some stuff here, version, there's a few makefile related files, but there's not actually a makefile in here. Um, there's here the documentation for the installation. If you've never done it before, you don't have your own notes. Uh, this, like I said, is extremely verbose for the R project. This is a very long file, and if you read it, you will know everything that you could need to know about the compilation prerequisites and steps. Most important here is this one that you can kind of see. It's called configure. 
And it's green and bold in my shell because it's an executable. It's a script. And we're going to run this. First, we're going to create a directory for the compiled software to live. This is in that module software directory that we created earlier that we said should be a, a network mount if we're doing this in a server infrastructure. A subdirectory for the program name, in this case R, and another subdirectory for the version number. You don't have to do it like this. You could, instead of being slash r slash 440, you could name that baked potato. I don't care. I do it like this because I have to manage the system and I want to know what it is in two years. And I look at it and I think, what is baked potato? After that, we're going to run the dot slash configure script. And a lot of the times, you'll just run dot slash configure itself and you'll ignore the rest of everything else that I've got here. But if you're doing it in modules, you want to make sure that it's going to put the compiled files in that directory that we just made for the compiled files. And the way we do that, 99% of the time with a configure script, almost always this exact same option name, it's not mandatory, anyone can write a script to do whatever they want, but 99% of the time it's dash dash prefix equals the name of the place that we want to put the files. You can't have a space bar in here. By the way, it's like you, there are many different types of build systems out there. This is dot slash configure, which is a very normal one. There's build, uh, there's a million different ones that I've used for putting things in modules. Some of them will allow you to have space bars, but not all of them. So if you start putting space bars in these, if you want to have your directory be named Ubuntu space Linux, don't, don't do that. You, it might work right now, but you will suffer down the line, and I don't want you to do that to yourself. The last option we're using here is dash dash enable R schlib. That's the shared R library. That's going to allow this compilation to take advantage of the version of R that's already installed on the system to help with the compilation. If we didn't do this, we'd have to manually compile a few other prerequisites, and for the purposes of this demo, I didn't want to do that. So that's why this option is here. You can or you cannot, depending on exactly what you want to get done when you actually do this in real life. So if we run the dot slash configure script, you'll see it scroll by way too fast for any human to read, but mostly what it's doing is checking. The dot slash configure does two things. One, it looks to make sure, generally, it's a script. You can do whatever you want in it. But generally, it looks to make sure you have everything you need. It checks for your prerequisites. It checks for your libraries. It checks for your build tools. And then the second thing that it does is it creates your make file. And have, spitting out so much information, it can be kind of hard to tell sometimes whether it actually completed successfully or not. So I normally like to check the exit code of the previous command, just echo dollar sign question mark will spit out zero if there were zero problems. It's the return value of the previous <clears throat> execution. Now you'll see a warning here, could not build info or HTML versions of the R manuals. That's fine, I don't care about those versions. I use regular man pages. And if we look now at the contents of their directory between what it was before we ran configure and what it is now that after we've run configure, you'll notice that there's a few more files in here. These are files that were created by the configure script. Most important among them is this one right here, the make file. This file, when you see this, tells you that you are ready to compile. If you download some Git repository from the internet and it already has a make file, you can generally just run make as it is without running any kind of configuration. But you would want to modify the make file by hand. That is occasionally something you have to do uh, to actually put the files uh, when you go to install them in the correct location on disk. So running make, we're going to give it this dash J, which means jobs. And the argument for jobs is the number of processors that we have on the machine. The reason we do this is so that make uses the whole entire CPU instead of just one core, one thread. This will allow us to get the compilation done quite a bit faster. And it's gonna vary depending on what kind of system you're running it on, whether it's gonna take five minutes or an hour and a half. I've had it vary greatly, uh, even just for R. But thanks to the magic of movie editing, this will complete in just a couple of seconds. Normally it takes quite a while, but if your dot slash configure ran successfully to the end with no critical errors, your make will generally run successfully to the end with no critical errors. <clears throat> and we can even look, oh, gotta start that one. We can even look directly in the, uh... all right, didn't have that slide. Uh, after we,
so sorry here. After we've made the software, after we've compiled it, we'll run make again, but with install, and that will put the files where they need to go. When we just make it, it'll keep it in the current working directory, but when we run make install afterwards, it actually moves the files to that other directory tree that we specified when we told it the prefix. And so we could, I don't have it in this demo here, but we could look in that directory and you would actually see there's, a, there's three directories in there all full of files, one bin, one lib, and one share. And those are uh, files that we're going to, or those are directories that we're going to be, oh, here's that, uh, here's that looking in there. <clears throat> bin, lib, and share. Those are the directories that we're going to actually put in to modules. Those are the directories that we're going to have modules handle and modify our shell environment with. When it comes to actually modifying the environment variables, there can be a lot or there can be a few. Depending on the project, you might need to modify a few, just one or as many as seven different environment variables. The first one that you're always going to have to modify universally is your path. Does everyone know what your path is for? Yeah. All right, cool. It's where your shell looks for binaries when you run a command. Up next is your LD library path. It's where your dynamic linker looks for libraries. Whenever a binary says, hey, I need a library, that's the dynamic linker, and the dynamic linker goes to find it. So if your compilation created any libraries that your dynamic linker will need, that path needs to be modified. Up next is man path, which, as the name may imply, is where man looks for man pages after it looks in the default locations. That's good. Up next, we've got the Python path. Now, this one is a lot less common to need modification. It's where your Python libraries are located. The reason that you might need to modify this one is if the project that you're setting up uh, integrates with Python, if it provides some, pro some libraries for Python. When, you, when you're in Python and you do import some library name, it looks, at the, it looks in the directories in your Python path. Or if the project itself is written in Python, you'll need to modify the Python path. Last two that you see occasionally and rarely are the C path and the package config path. These are where the development libraries are stored. If you are compiling a prerequisite in order to then compile something else uh, for modules, you'll need to modify one or both of these paths. Uh, the reason for that is just so that when dot slash configure runs and looks for the development versions of these libraries, it can find them. Now, every single one of these follows the same exact structure. Every single one of these is, I'm going to use this here. Is this, this is on screen, right? This is in the recording. Cool. Every one of these has some structure where it's path, colon, path, colon, path. You get the idea. <clears throat> it's a bunch of different paths separated by colons. And we want to prepend these paths. <clears throat> in our, our module file itself. So to do that, first we're going to create a new directory for the module file itself to live in. And unlike for the software where we had a directory for the version, here it's just a file. And I've pre-typed all of this here so that you didn't have to see me struggling and hitting backspace a bunch. I was a little nervous doing the, during the demo. <clears throat> first line here is mandatory. This is you know uh, just a little piece of jargon line for modules to see. So it sees this and it says, okay, I know this is in fact a module file. I can go ahead and continue processing this. Otherwise, it would see that some random file, maybe a readme or something that you left in that directory on accident. And it would say, I'm just not gonna, just not gonna look at that. It helps keep modules resilient. Next, we're going to set root, which is just a local uh, variable for this script here. This is, this is a TCL script. Um, local envi my environment variable for this script to the original root path that we put our final compiled software in, this module software R440. The reason that we do this with a separate environment variable here is so that we can simplify the structure of this next section. So we can just keep calling root over and over again. This way, when, mod when R441 comes out in a couple of months, I just have to copy this one file and change one number to create my new module file. I don't have to go change it everywhere in here. Higher propensity for error, higher chance that I do something wrong. This minimizes the amount of mistakes that I could possibly make and decreases the amount of time that it could take 
for me to set something up new for my users. We're using this prepend path here, which is a module specific TCL command. We're just giving it the name of the path that we want to modify, and here you can see there's a bunch of them. And then the path, which are all subdirectories of this root directory. These are the actual files that we compiled. We are prepending to these various different paths. We're changing path, LD library path, man path, package config path, and C path. And lastly, we're conflicting with R. That's not absolutely necessary because you can have R installed on the machine and load it through a module, and then you can load another module on top of that. I do this to force my users to keep their module setups pretty simplified because I don't like getting the email, hey, my modules isn't working, and I go to look and they've got five different versions of R loaded. So to force them to only load one at a time, I make it conflict with any other version of R. You could make this conflict with specific versions, but I just do it for any version. So hey, if you want to load R, just load one of the R's. So we've compiled the software, we've put it in place, we have built the module file for it. Now all that's left to do is to actually use the modules. And that could not be simpler. Like I said, this is something that you can teach your users in one minute. This is not something like Docker that's going to take them hours or days or weeks to learn. This is something so simple, you need four subcommands. And those are the four subcommands that 99% of your users are going to use. Those are the four subcommands that you are going to use 99% of the time. There are other ones, there's help, there's what is, there's uh, info that gives you information if you put it about your modules that you've built. But these four are the four that you actually need to use to use modules. Avail shows you what modules are there on the system. So most of my email traffic gets just nipped in the bud because the scientist logs in and they say, module avail. They say, oh, hey, that newer version of ours is already there. I don't need to send them an email. Wonderful. Module load. That, as the name may imply, loads a module into your environment. Module list shows you what you currently have loaded. And module unload takes that module right out of your environment. Modules is written well enough that all of those prepend paths that we did, when you go to unload it, it'll just undo that. It'll plop those right out of your environment and you won't have to go in and manually muck about with anything. You don't have to manually tell it, hey, when you unload, make sure that you do, make sure that you actually take these things out. It knows to do that because when it loaded, it prepended the path. So let's look at actually running the software from modules. First, this is Ubuntu 23.10 in the demo. So, um, well, actually, this is, this is module available. That shows us our module. These are the defaults. Ubuntu 23.10 default is 4.3.1 uh, for R. That's what's already available. If we then load the module, we get 4.4.0. And that's it. That's all your end user has to do. If you're setting up software for yourself on your own local laptop, that's all you have to do to change between versions of the program. You go from 431 to 440 in one command. That is all the usage that's needed. This, if, is, uh, if this module's installation is shared on the network, this is portable across different people in one lab, different labs in one institution one person on multiple servers, they only need to know, oh yeah, if I want to use this version of R, I just run one single command. That's all I have to do. <clears throat> that's not all. You, that's the basic usage of modules, but there's a lot more that you can do because like I said, modules is just a TCL script at the end of the day. Anything that you can script, you can do when a module loads or unloads. Anything that you can imagine, you could set up network mounts, you could create directories, you could change ownership of files, you could open firewall ports when a module loads, if that's what you need today. You can do anything that you can imagine in modules whenever somebody loads or unloads. You've all been a very wonderful audience. Thank you very much for coming. I've been your speaker. My name is Romeo. That's a picture. I'm an HPC Sys admin which I put in air quotes because it's a made up word that has been replaced with a thousand other words throughout time, whether you're a sysop or a sysadmin or a systems engineer or a infrastructure developer or SRE or DevOps or whatever tomorrow's buzzword is gonna be. We are all the same, we are professional Linux users. I've been doing it for about the last decade and 
If you want to reach me over the electronic mail, you can do so. I'm root at punkto.org. You can shoot me an email. And that is my website. If you go there, you will find the slides for this talk and eventually a recording as well. Does anybody have any questions? Just out of curiosity, does R now have much Python in it? Does, uh, so the question was, does R now have much Python in it? Um, no. So there, you don't need to use the Python path yeah, I, I environment thought, variable. At least last time I used it, I thought it was all C. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's not it's not written in Python. Um, it doesn't have built-in Python integration. There is some aftermarket stuff that you can do to modify it to get it to work nicely yeah, with Python. Using Python. Yeah, but by default in this compilation, we didn't set the Python path for for the R installation, and we, you don't need to. Um, yeah, that's only I only put that up there as uh, hey, this is something you might have to do. If the th there are other projects I've used in the path that create their own Python libraries. Uh, just as like, hey, if you want to interact with this program over Python, that's the kind of time that you would need to set that Python path environment variable. And they are, it still runs on Unix's other than Linux, right? I assume so, yeah. I mean, it's, it's if you can get it to compile, then, then you can get it to run. Myself, I only run it on Linux because that's all that my infrastructure is. Usually there's a if devs and what in the C code, if it's properly written, and you need to have some environmental variables that can be get triggered by the C code, so it it basically runs the um, it does the proper um, inserts in your C code during the compile process. Okay, so I, if I understand so you, we used to use something called autocom that basically would distinguish between your Unixes. And of course, nothing ever went perfectly right, so you were screwing with the code all the time. Yeah, yeah, screwing with the code is something that you'll find yourself doing up most frequently for less maintained or less big projects than something massive like R, which yeah, has R. millions of users but, probably. But even, I don't know if you heard of RAS. So RAS? RAS, it's a geographic information system. No, I've never heard of that. It's a beautiful package, but the code was really written before we had very good standards. Um, I learned a lot of programming from grass, the okay. grass code. But the result is, is it was a mess to compile. Yeah, yeah, you'll occasionally find applications that are just a mess to compile, but like, like grass, like you're saying, but um, in general, my experience has been that the compilation steps for things that are undocumented for projects that don't have a, here's how you install me are generally the same at least for for more modern projects i don't know about grass uh, for more modern projects they're generally the same as projects that are big like r that have the documented steps so if you take those same steps and just transpose them a little bit i mean drop off a couple of options that are clearly not needed like enable rshlib for if you're compiling something completely unrelated yeah i haven't been doing that sort of work for quite a long time now, but that that was basically my my understanding or my finding too. It was once you got used to it, it was pretty standard. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Is anyone else? Well, thank you very much for coming. <laughs>